Many citizens have voted for the SPD because they want a change of government. We have at this time no certain end results, no certain numbers, but we can say already that we can't be satisfied with the result. We wanted more, but we didn't achieve it. This was also due to my own mistakes at the beginning of the campaign. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Olaf Scholz and his Social Democrats secure a narrow win against the governing CDU. Now, the SPD leader says a so-called traffic light coalition is possible. Long queues outside British petrol stations. The UK government considers drafting the army to get fuel. The energy crisis goes global. And Evergrande fallout spreads while wealthy investors join thousands of Chinese households demanding their money back. So we do have our work cut out for us this week. There's quite a lot going on. And then we have a little bit later in the week also the ECB forum. But this is what the markets are looking at today. So we did start a strong actually an hour ago with the, the European stocks. That's 100 gains some 0.8 percent. So it does seem like we're holding on to gains, but not as much as before. Amongst the biggest gainers, we still have a lot of the commodity rich. Again, for example, if you look at the energy crisis here in the UK, it's not a problem of not having fuel. The problem is of getting the fuel to the petrol stations. So it is supportive of some of the commodity companies that supported, for example, on the FTSE. You can see a Brent crude um, at 78.88. And then overall, the DAX. We need to talk about the DAX because we spent two hours yesterday live on Bloomberg TV on the Sunday looking at the election results. It seems that there are a number of ways that the coalition could do but the markets are actually taking in their stride because there's not a far left and actually, um, you know, component of this possible coalition. And also it was kind of priced in that it would take a couple of months to go through everything. So uh, the map in Europe, I don't know whether there's a huge difference between what we're seeing, for example, in the FTSE or the DAX. Um, but you can see the DAX gained some 0.9 percent, the UK 0.3 percent. And overall, if you look at the industry groups that are moving the most, it's definitely energy stocks at the highest with technology stocks as well. So Olaf Scholz and his Social Democrats inch ahead in the CDU or inch ahead of the CDU in an unprecedentedly tight German election. Though these preliminary results suggest there will be months of government building talks, the leader of the SPD has in the past hours said that a so-called traffic light coalition is possible. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Berlin. So Maria, it's unclear who has a candidate but it, or the mandate, but it does seem that actually Olaf Scholz, because he's done better than the CDU, could have the upper hand. Yes, and Francine, you know, that's a message uh, that is coming out of the uh, SPD in the past hour. Again, repeating this line that the winner is Olaf Schultz. So this was a big turnaround for the Social Democrats that they have won uh, the election. And the fact that they've added seats and the CDU has lost seats, it's a very clear signal from uh, the German population that they should now go into the opposition. And the SPD wants to trigger the process to kickstart those talks with the other parties. Now, again, this takes us to a traffic light coalition. The only issue of course here is that the vote is very tight and for Armin Laschet he knows in his political calculus that right now he has two options he either forms a government or he will or could likely be out of the CDU after that election result yesterday which was the worst for the union since the second world war so he will fight to try to make this uh, happen just very quickly I know that you, you referred to the market reaction what's also uh, being uh, very much priced in and factored in this morning is that it's now clear based on this preliminary results that this red scare this far to the left uh, government coalition it's not going to happen so essentially you're looking at two very centrist options going forward it's either the traffic lights or the Jamaica but both of them see a very mainstream pro-European party leading a government so again it would seem like a very messy scenario happening in Germany but ultimately you're looking at two very centrist uh, politicians trying to form a government. All right, Maria, thank you so much, Maria Tadeo there in Berlin for us. Now, we're joined by Eric Nielsen, Group Chief Economist at Unicredit, who also knows intimately uh, Berlin and, of course, Germany. Eric, as always, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's unclear to me. I know there's a, a clear win for the SPD, um, or at least they haven't lost votes like the CDU have. But if you're the Liberals and if you're the Greens, because the CDU you know, could be more desperate. Certainly Armin Laschet has his last chance to actually strike a government. Would you not negotiate with them first because they're willing to give you more leeway? 
Yeah, Francine, that's a possibility. Uh, as we heard yesterday, Lindner from FDP invited the Greens to start to make an agreement between those two parties and to become the, the true kingmakers. Last year, however, you're right, in exactly as you said. I think he has this problem that he can he would probably like to give almost anything away because as your colleague said, if he doesn't become Chancellor, he's probably he's out of Berlin for sure and may go back to Aachen, but for certain he's out of national policy. But he has a right wing of the CDU that he also has to appease. So, uh, so you could imagine that whatever he agrees will then ha have to be sent out for votes to the members of the CDU, which is more to the right than he is, and maybe yeah. they would then turn him down. Uh, so, so he has a, he has two sides to this, right? So, Eric, when you look at you know coalitions have been tried to be built in the past. Are we absolutely certain that actually the FDP, the Liberals, and the Greens want to go into power? Yeah, I think they, they all want to go into power. They are, they, they, the question is whether they overplay their hand. I mean, I saw one commentary I, uh, say that if they overplay the, their power, maybe you get another grand coalition now with the Social Democrats at the, at the Chancery. I, I think that we have to... We'll be well into next year before we could get to that possibility. So I think it's a pretty it is it's a pretty given that we are going to get one of those two three party coalitions. And I still think, uh, as I wrote a week ago, that uh, the odds are that it's going to be the traffic light under Olaf Scholz. But it's who knows, right? At this time, um, Eric, what's your bet on so what it means for the energy transition? Uh, what does it mean for, for example, real estate in Germany? I mean, there's, a, you know, there's also a, an election in Berlin that happened yesterday. Yeah, this is very important stuff. Uh, I think the, uh, the Greens would have to get money for the green transition, right? It is a, and, uh, and FDP has to give in on some of that. Uh, there is the, this issue that they may do it through extra budgetary funds, which is a mess. And I would say that the Greens have been the only ones saying we should change the Constitution so we can actually run a deficit to finance this part. The other very important aspect, Quentin, is, of course, with, with regard to Europe, uh, where this is going to take a long time. Uh, and how they would address that specific issue on how to finance it will translate straight into the issue of the fiscal rules in Europe, uh, which is having a, a bigger impact, I suspect, into next year. Uh, so a lot is at stake in uh, who sort of gets the upper hand in these negotiations in the coming few months. So, Eric, we have, what, two, three months of possible coalition building, or could it come any sooner? And what happens to the economy in those two, three months? Is it a big vacuum, or does it actually make not much of a difference? No, it doesn't make so much of a difference. Angela Merkel stays on until the coalition is in place. Uh, and, um, and the calendar, as I understand it, is, is full. Uh, life goes on. But, of course, you don't get any big initiatives and no big agreements on things in Europe, for example, the fiscal rules. So that's sort of the, the, the price uh, we, we have to pay. Uh, my guess is it's going to be Christmas and maybe even uh, into winter before we get an agreement. This is really tight and complicated. But um, it would be nice if we, we get a surprise in a government one way or the other before Christmas. But I, I cannot doubt it. Eric, what are the key issues that actually, you know, the FTP or the Greens will want? I know we've heard, for example, that the FTP definitely want to put their leader as finance minister. What does that mean for the deficit and also further European integration? Yeah, that's, a, that's I think, from the market's point of view, is the key question. Uh, but first, remember that the, in Germany, when you have a coalition, you have a very detailed coalition agreement. And that's what takes so long to negotiate. So the fiscal policy and the issue of the debt and the financing of the green transition will be written into this. So in that sense, the finance minister position becomes a little bit less important than people sometimes think. But as time then goes by, of course, the bureaucracy and the power of the finance ministry uh, pulls, uh, comes in. And, and there are the, the two key candidates, obviously, are uh, Lindner, as you said, from FTP, who badly wants it, and it's Robert Habeck, the uh, co-head of the Green Party. Uh, for those believing in the, the need to finance this transition, uh, I think in the market people are probably leaning to hoping for Robert Habeck winning, uh, but again, the, the finance minister position, uh, because it's certainly outside Germany, I can speak for, you, for, for, for investors, there is a great skepticism to this Schwarze Null, the, the no 
uh, debt financial lintner and part of CDU stands for, uh, but we'll see. Eric, thank you so much. Eric Nielsen there from Unicredit, who stays with us. Now, coming up, Europe's energy crisis starts to spread to the rest of the world. We discuss its impact on the global economic recovery next. If you have any questions, you can send them IB plus TV Go or tweet me at FLACWA. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacway here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has pledged to pass a $550 billion infrastructure bill this Thursday. Pelosi says she will put the measure forward on Monday. The Senate has already passed the roads and bridges bill, but Democrats are divided on a wider package of spending and tax measures. Pelosi says the headline amount that the bill will be lowered from $3.5 trillion. Let me just say we're going to pass the bill this week. Uh, the, the, uh, I promised that we would bring the bill to the floor. That was according to the language that those who wanted this to be brought to the floor tomorrow wrote into the rule. We will bring the bill to the floor tomorrow for, for um, consideration. But you know, I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is delaying enforcement of a rule change some bond traders said could cause big disruptions by preventing dealers from providing certain price quotes. The measure is intended to protect investors from pump and dump schemes often seen in penny stocks. Previously, the rule had not been applied to fixed income and industry groups say more time is needed to create a framework for the change. China says it's aiming to double geothermal power generation by 2025, compared with 2020 levels. The National Energy Administration is also targeting a further doubling of geothermal capacity in the 10 years after that. It comes as China faces an energy supply crunch, with almost half its 23 provinces missing targets set by Beijing and now under pressure to curb power use. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, power Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, uh, Laura Wright. Now, we're just getting some breaking news out of uh, cryptocurrencies. This was on the back, of course, of, I mean, unrelated, but actually China uh, last week really cracked down on cryptocurrencies. And now just the latest headline uh, crossing the Bloomberg terminal is on Robinhood experienced some issues with crypto trading. Now, this is something that we need to keep an eye on uh, because, of course, if it stays on, it would have an ability to, I guess, false the market if you can't trade properly. Unclear why exactly this is happening right now so we'll just reach out to Robin Hood as we're trying to already to understand how long this would last. Now Europe's energy crisis deepens. The UK government is taking emergency measures to ease fuel shortages across the country. In Asia China ramps up gas imports adding to global price pressures. So what impact will this have on the global economic recovery? Well Eric Nielsen from Unicredit is still with us. Eric thank you so much for sticking around. It's unclear actually how long this fuel shortage lasts and it's not only the UK for a number of reasons there are there's also fuel shortage in northeast China and uh, you know other parts of the world and whether it gets better but then it gets worse like how do you see it developing uh, it's a very difficult one to, to uh, call I mean it's one thing is very clear to me it's it's bottlenecks of various types uh, some of them probably politically driven like uh, the gas crisis in Europe or emerging gas crisis in Europe because of Russia uh, related probably to Nord Stream 2 uh, in Britain, of course, we have the additional issues of truck drivers because of Brexit and, and the pandemic and, and the rest of it. So, uh, so there are a lot of different issues around the world, as far as I can judge, uh, but none of them are sort of systemic, fundamental ones. Uh, so I would, I would think that we get some, some further noise, but then things start to clear up. Eric, is this inflationary, or is it the kind of temporary inflation that central banks talk about? <laughs> It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, it, it is, if I'm right, it is temporary, uh, but almost certainly it is temporary. Think about it this way. If you get an oil price shock or energy price shock, uh, then and prices go up by X percent, in a year that has washed through, right? And the important thing when you talk about monetary policy is that for Europe and for Britain and for, 
for most of the Western world, this is like a tax on businesses and consumers uh, outright. You have to pay more for imported uh, input into your production. And central banks should not tighten to curb that inflation, partly because it's temporary, as I said, but also you will just add additional restraint on, on, on the economy by doing so. So, Eric, who does this benefit, if anyone? Are there, you know, is there a, a faction of the industry? Does it actually help with the change to renewables or not so much? Uh, yet, uh, it is uh, it's a good question, right? It is a sort of, you could say it's a sort of zero-sum game. Who, those who have the energy in, in their storages or in, in, the, in the ground uh, stand to benefit. But also a lot of those distributors and, uh, that you have, typically what you see when prices go up in these type of, of, uh, of supply crises is the margins go up for a while. Uh, and, and obviously the obvious losers are consumers and uh, all the businesses which take as a net input the energy side. So uh, relative moves could be quite substantially, but hopefully mm -hmm. temporary. Um, Eric, I know there was a big move in treasuries and actually in, in all asset classes last week. I mean, what do you need to know today from central banks to have a better understanding maybe on whether the reflation trade or in just in general, whether the recovery is here to stay and strong enough to sustain the kind of valuations that we've seen? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. This I and I don't, I'm not sure I exactly know where we're going right now. But what is very clear is that from late August we had the first uh, high income country uh, hike interest rates in South Korea. Then we had last week we had Norway. We got more noise about possible rate hikes out of the Bank of England, uh, maybe even November, but more likely after New Year. The Fed has said they will taper and they will taper a little bit faster than we thought. The ECB says we have we, we, we think inflation is temporary and we are not going to mm -hmm. withdraw monetary stimulus. Yet we know that there's huge political pressure inside the governing council to end the PEP, uh, the pandemic facility. And I don't think there's any real reason to think they can substitute it with other measures. So they probably also stand to withdraw some stimulus. So, uh, so it is a little bit like central banks around the world I look at the growth rates. I'm not so worried that GDP levels are not quite up where they should be. And some of them are worried about inflation, that people like me could be wrong, that this is a longer lasting inflation. They start to take out some insurance policy against it by starting to withdraw some stimulus. So, and it's not particularly coordinated. So as I wrote on Sunday I, or yesterday, I, I, I wonder why your dollar is not going weaker, but, uh, but it hasn't so far. Yeah. Eric, thank you so much. Eric Nielsen, the Group Chief Economist at Unicredit, joining us today on a number of themes. Now, coming up, Evergrande's debt crisis is rippling through global markets. We discuss the latest next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacroix here in London. Now, Evergrande's electric car unit is the latest to admit there's no guarantee it can meet its financial obligations. That is as holders of the developer's dollar bond say they have yet to be paid for a coupon that was due last week. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's China debt reporter, Rebecca Chung-Wilkins. Rebecca, thank you for joining us. So what exactly is happening in China's credit markets today? Well, the broader credit markets here still feel really jittery today. Um, kind of the broader high yield markets down about one cent on the dollar and some of these weaker rated names and names like Sunak and Fantasia also kind of under pressure today. Um, and, you know, just to put that in broader context, we're already at yields between 14 and 15 percent, which is incredibly high for this part of the market. So what's next for Evergrande's bond payments? Well, of course, as you say, we still have bondholders awaiting the coupon that was due later um, last week. And then again this week, we have another $45 million due uh, Wednesday on a dollar bond. Um, and then in October, we have four more bond coupons due. So it is a really big month for Evergrande. Investors are looking at this very, very closely, waiting for clarity on any kind of potential restructure or what's going to happen with these upcoming payments. 
Rebecca, thank you so much. Rebecca Chung Wilkins there with the very latest, of course, on Evergrande. Now, coming up, German stocks surge after the SPD clinches a narrow victory in the election. Coalition talks are poised to drag on. So we'll just discuss that next with Isabel Baruki, the professor at the University of C. And again, mathematically, there are only two or three ways a coalition would go. So we look at, dig deep into exactly who could become finance minister, what the consequences of that for the debt deal are, and of course, some of the other things including what that means for further Europe integration. Now, a look at also the markets. The markets are holding strong, but not actually not as strong as before. If you look at the European stocks, um, 600, they're getting some 0.3%. Again, the focus is on fuel shortages. And also, markets don't really 100% know how to read the China question. So China, Evergrande, and everything in between. We'll have the latest on the markets shortly. This is Bloomberg. Olive Schultz and his Social Democrats secure a narrow win against the governing CDU, but Germany could see months of coalition talks. Long queues outside British petrol stations. Now, the UK government considers drafting the army to get fuel. The energy crisis goes global. And Evergrande fallout spreads. Well, wealthy investors join thousands of Chinese households demanding their money back. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So Germany's SPD narrowly wins the German election after an incredibly tight race with the CDU. That's according to provisional results. Now, with no clear majority, the decision is yet to be made of who will lead Europe's biggest economy. Well, we heard from both candidates after the exit polls. It's going to be a long election night, that's for sure. But it's also certain that many citizens have voted for the SPD because they want a change of government and because they want the name of the next chancellor to be Olaf Scholz. We have at this time no certain end results, no certain numbers, but we can say already that we can't be satisfied with the result. Still, the result of this election is as of yet unclear. It will be a long evening. In any case, the result of the election means Germany, the Union and all democratic parties face big challenges. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Chad Thomas in Berlin, who helped us, of course, with our coverage last night as well, Chad. Uh, if you look at who has a mandate, so both the CDU and the SPD say they could form a government. So I guess the question is, who do the Greens and FDP want to go in government with? Well, that acts, act absolutely is the question, uh, Francine, and that is what we're going to be trying to find out today. Armin Lasha was talking about the long uh, election evening. Now we're in for a very long day afterward and ultimately probably weeks and months to come. Uh, really, it's up to the FDP and Greens at this point whom they want to get into a coalition with. I think one of the interesting things to come out of last night is that the FTP and Greens said that they will speak with one another before they talk to the SPD or the CDU. So it sounds like they're going to try and sort of square some of the circles that they are facing with one another in terms of their policy differences and try to get the best deal they can from whomever they end up in a coalition with. So we'll be watching very closely today the press conferences from all of the parties to hear from them whom they will start some of these initial talks with as you and I were discussing last night. Now we're into the speed dating where everybody uh, has those initial conversations with one another before moving forward into the more formal talks uh, down the road. Chad, thank you so much. I know we talk about speed dating, but actually coalition talks could also last a couple of months. So it's a speed long dating. Chad Thomas there with the very latest from Berlin. Now we're joined by Tim Adams, chief executive of the Institute of International Finance, to talk about the main challenges, not only, of course, involving international finance, but the world economy. Tim, first of all, thank you so much for coming into the studio. I mean, it's great to be back. Francine. It's great to see you in person. You I, look fabulous. Thank I mean, you. you're traveling, which means that actually things are getting a little bit better. And I'm ready. We have the German election. <laughs> uh, the results are unclear because they're still trying to coalition build right. but with Angela Merkel left what does it mean for the state of Europe and how Europe actually interacts with the US sure well, it's going to take some time to figure out what this coalition whatever it looks tra traffic light or Jamaica whatever it's going to take months I think there's some good news one is the young people and voters turned out in mass so they believe in democracy 
Two, something about centrist cont uh, continuity I think is very important. The Greens won big, and I think that tells us about the future. We're all going to go green over time. Uh, and I think it also tells us that Europe, there is a vote for Europe, and I think there's a vote for the transatlantic relationship. Uh, Damon, if you look at some of the you know, major changes over the next two to three months to a couple of years, is it Europe trying to find its place between the U.S. and China? And actually, what does it mean for the banking sector? What does it mean for the kind of recovery we could see? Sure, of course, we have elections in France, so obviously that's huge. And post-Brexit, Europe is trying to figure out its way. Uh, they'd hoped that maybe a Biden administration had given them different signals in China, but there's more continuity vis-a-vis -vis China than anyone expected. So, yes, it's trying to find a middle way between the U.S. and China. That's hard. And to the Chinese make it harder, and the U.S. makes it harder. I know you put some, you know, fabulous events on, usually at the margins of the IMF or some of these big uh, thinkers that you are able to attract and speak to almost on a weekly basis. What are they asking or what are the, some of the, the concerns that they have in this post-pandemic world? Sure. It is about the U.S.-China relationship and how do we find our way through without it being a new Cold War. I don't like that phrase because I don't think that's accurate. But we need to find a way to work together on climate change. You can't solve climate change without the U.S. and China at the table working collaboratively. So I think that is a huge relationship, U.S. relationship with Europe going forward, the future of uh, the U.K. and Brexit. Uh, and then central banking, what's the world going to look like when easy money dissipates and we're back to something that looks like normal? What about zombie companies and how do we think about growth going forward? Yeah, and zombie company actually is, is something that I know a lot of the financial institutions have tried to do work on. I think there was also a, a piece signed by Mario Draghi before he became prime minister. Are we doing enough work to try and understand actually, you know, when this cheap money goes away, what we're left with? Uh, indeed, I think what we're going to find that there's a lot of companies that probably can't survive. And actually, from a productivity standpoint, washing out some of the, the low producers probably is helpful. If you're working for those companies, it's not helpful. So there is a societal aspect, but ultimately, I think it's good for growth. Okay, where are we on the banking union? I don't know whether we'll ever get anything in our lifetime at this point. <laughs> Francie, we've been talking about banking union for a long, long time. I think we've been talking about it for a long time. We need it. We need consolidation across Europe. We need efficiency in the system. We need the application of new technologies. We need to spend billions in new technologies. And we need to finance this green transition to a low carbon and ultimately net zero carbon world. That's going to take a very vibrant banking system and capital markets. We need it. We need it soon. Yeah, we certainly need it soon. So maybe you'll go to Brussels and remind everyone that actually it should be something on their priority list. I don't know how we deal with China at this point. So it's unclear exactly what you know happens to those dollar bond payments. Unclear exactly what the end game of China with international investors is. Right. You know, I think on Evergrande, it's a, it's a particular case. Obviously, the sector is under stress. But Beijing has been signaling for some time they want to take some froth out of the property sector. The problem is the property sector is a third of GDP. So there's going to be a, be a hit to growth. We become pretty bearish in the near term Chinese outlook. But I think ultimately it's about taking leverage out of the system to make the system more stable and safer over the medium term. Do, do you think they'll send a signal? And I don't know whether Evergrande, because of the sheer mass of it, is, is the right way of looking at a possible signal from China. If they want to let steam out, is there anything that could be, you know, in default soon? Oh, I think there's a signal that you should listen to Beijing when they tell you not to leverage up. So they can make an example out of them. I think ultimately the, the, those who bought houses and had advance payments, I think the suppliers and maybe the foreign bondholders will end up being saved. Domestic bondholders, domestic equity holders, doubtful. Um, Tim, overall, what kind of recovery are we going to see? Is it a two-speed, and we're talking about booster shots in the U.S.? I know you have, you know, you're always a big thinker in these kind of things. What does it mean, again, for institutions and central banks? Are we really going to create this world of, like, two, three, even four different speeds? It is multiple speeds, and it's also the service sector versus the goods sector. We had hoped the service sector would be back more robust now, but because of the Delta variant, that hasn't happened. Hopefully it will next year. And the goods sector is hampered by the supply chain problems. You know, the ports on the West Coast in California, 60, 70 percent. There's container ships lined up out in the ports, no truckers, no warehousing, and then obviously the challenge is here in the UK about just getting petrol. So it's a supply side challenge, but really globally. Yes, yeah, so did we actually um, misread the supply chain challenges? you know, during the Trump era, there was a belief in the markets that actually, because President Trump was very tough on China, that those supply chains have moved and we'd be fine no matter what. Right. Well, I think what we're learning, one, is that uh, suppliers respond to price signals and prices are going up, so suppliers. Okay. But there's just these logistical uh, bottlenecks. I don't think we really understood. Or, uh, for example, uh, drivers here in the U.K., you need drivers to get petrol to the stations. They didn't have them. Some of that's because of Brexit. But we need, uh, we need to focus more on the supply side.
Tim, cryptocurrency. Yeah. I mean, everybody has a view on cryptocurrency, and half the people love it, and half the people actually hate it and thinks it should be regulated. Yes, we're gonna, it's going to be regulated. Uh, we've seen Gary Gensler, who I think is going to be the most uh, profound SEC chairman probably in a generation. We've seen the Chinese. Anyone in the, in the crypto era who thought that it was going to uh, escape regulatory scrutiny that was going to be this utopic libertarian world, I think is in for a harsh surprise. It's going to be regulated. It's going to be regulated pretty soon. So what are you expecting from Gary Gensler? Again, a, a lot of our international you know, viewers read about him, but probably don't know him as well as, as you. Is he dogmatic? Is it, you know, is it just more regulation, but smart regulation? Or is there a danger that there's over-regulation? Well, he's, he's incredibly smart. Uh, he knows this area. He used to teach a class on Bitcoin at MIT. So he knows the topic. He's been given a great uh, remit to actually take sweeping changes. There is a chance for overreaction because there's a question about their uh, capacity to regulate some of these and the legal uh, definition of some of these assets. So probably overreaction early and then they'll sort it out later. But regulation is coming. U.S. debt ceiling. Should we worry about it? I feel like, you know, in my lifetime as a reporter, I've had to deal with it many times and it always sorts itself out. Yes. What is the time? I mean, is it the same this time? It's like the perils of Pauline, you know, they get her off the tracks just in time for the train come. I think this is similar to it. I think we're going to see some sweeping policy changes this week. Uh, of an infrastructure bill, which will be passed, a larger bill, which still is in question. But I think we'll escape a uh, government shutdown, and I think we'll get an extension of the debt ceiling. Tim, what does international finance need, apart from clearer rules and, I guess, the same rules across the board? We need uh, shots in arms. We need to get vaccines out, and we need to get back to normal. That's why I'm here, is a message of normality. Tim, thank you so much for joining us on set today. Tim Adams, the chief executive of the Institute of International Finance, with some great insight and thoughts. Up next, panic at the petrol pumps, fuel shortages, pile pressure on the UK government. The impact of Europe's energy crisis starts to spread to the rest of the world. We'll have a full roundup of what this means for everyone. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hey, Francine. Google's YouTube CEO says the internet giant still holds free speech as a core value. Speaking to Bloomberg in the company's first public comment since it agreed to a Russian government order to remove material from political opponents, Susan Wojcicki said Google had many things to consider when making decisions on content. YouTube has faced criticism for pulling videos by opposition politician Alexei Navalny. We certainly get requests from governments, um, and and we look and consider what's you know why are we getting the request? What's actually happening on the ground? Um, and based on a whole bunch of different factors, we make a decision. Um, so we don't always like those are not always requests that make sense for us to honor, but in certain cases, you know, we will honor them um, in that country. The ride-hailing unit of Geely is in talks with investors for another series of funding after it raised almost $600 million earlier this month. Cow Cow Mobility says the next round may be completed in the first half of next year as it looks to catch up with market leader Didi. Didi controls as much as 80% of China's ride-hailing market, but it was removed from app stores after Beijing ordered it to strengthen data protection. That's the Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Laura. Now, Britain's pumps ran dry over the weekend after a supply chain crisis prompted panic buying of gasoline. Here you can see the long queues outside UK petrol stations, while the fuel shortage is also dominating headlines this morning. The Times leads with the headline, Army will be sent in to tackle the crisis. Similar headline on The Guardian, petrol crisis, the PM, to rule on using Army to deliver fuel, and the mirror with the simple heading shambles. Let's get the latest now over the intensifying energy crisis. Here in the UK, the government taking emergency measures to try to ease these fuel shortages across the country as gasoline retailers shut pumps after days of panic buying. Well, joining us now is Alaric Nightingale. He leads, of course, Bloomberg's European oil markets team. Alaric, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, this is an absolute mess, right? You call it shambles, you can call it whatever you want. But how does the prime minister sort this? Well, uh, the measures that he's trying to take are to uh, bring in the army, potentially, uh, the, the easing the fuel short, the uh, visas 
for uh, overseas workers. Uh, th those are difficult solutions. They're not, they're not something that's just going to uh, be, be a magic wand because uh, who... Who wants to come to the UK? I mean, I'm not saying that they don't, but it's not it's not everybody's choice, and they've got they've got jobs, so it's a competitive market. Europe has its own challenges in terms of drivers, uh, so th those issues are there. I think that one of the solutions will simply be that there is no shortage in the country of fuel, so eventually there's going to have to be a normalisation of demand at the pump. That will come at some point. People will fill up; they won't have to keep filling up. Um, and so you'll see a calming down and a resupply at, at some of the stations. But equally, you have a concertina effect at, uh, in terms of the supply chain now because um, suddenly um, there was a shortage of drivers and, and, and they're not where they were expected to be. I mean, I think there's a shortage of like 100,000 drivers and I think the government is looking at maybe, you know, giving 5,000 some visas. So I'm not sure, again, if the numbers square up. We have a viewer question. It's a good question on the energy transition. Remember, to everyone, you can just send them to us on IB Plus TV Go. So this person's writing in, Alric, and it says, if the transition is pushed even more aggressively, the energy transition, and fossil fuel supplies fall prematurely, wouldn't Europe and the world face an even worse energy crisis? I mean, is this a misnomer because actually the problem is the drivers and not the actual fuel? Uh, I, yeah, I, I would agree with that, that there is um, clearly a, a, you know, it's, a, it's not a fuel supply issue, but that's it's still an interesting question to explore because um, if, you, if you do take fossil fuels away too quickly um, and there isn't the replacement fuel supply, yeah, that, sure, that's an issue. Um, and so you have to uh, make careful plans and, and, and make sure that you're mapping your um, supply of, of electricity and, and alternatives to uh, future demand patterns and, and you, you can't have shortfalls and you know as we've seen with the wider energy crisis if you have renewables you have to make sure that you have a reliable supply so in, in the wider sense the energy crisis is uh, you know that, that's a valid question. So Alaric, I mean I was talking about energy security 10 years ago on Bloomberg TV is the government, you know, why is, has the government not taken this so seriously? Um, I don't know that, it's, that it hasn't taken it seriously. I think it's just, um, you know, th these are um, evolving demand patterns and it's harder to, uh, you know, judge renewables and, you know, exactly how the, the different demand patterns are going to play out. So, um, you know, what also we had the virus um, which created a, a very significant shift in demand patterns and yeah maybe they've just you know got a few a few things wrong all right Alaric thanks so much Alaric Nightingale there of Bloomberg coming up a rule revamp on pause the SEC is giving a three-month extension to a new rule that could upend bond trading more on that next this is Bloomberg We have no exposure to Evergrande, is the short answer. Uh, our own strategy on China for the last several years uh, has been built on building independent credit decisions and credit underwriting. Well, that was DBS Chief Executive Piyush Gupta on Evergrande risks. Now, let's check in on the markets. And actually, we're seeing quite a lift off for the markets, but not as much as they were lifting off just about an hour ago. So we started the day on a high on the, the trading platform. If you look at some of the, um, I guess, narratives that are out there, first of all, Germany leads a pretty upbeat European stocks after the elections. This is because uh, we definitely got rid of some of the tailwinds that the markets were worried about, which was the far left coming in with too much regulation European stocks in general you know on the up but investors still trying to assess whether global growth can withstand a slowdown in China and this global energy crunch that we have extra extra reporting on now a pause for new rules for the bond market the US SEC is giving debt markets at least three more months to prepare for a rule revision that insiders say would upend trading for some debt securities after a small uproar from bond dealers the SEC announced that the rule won't be enforced for fixed income securities until January. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's finance managing editor for EMEA, Michael Moore. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. How significant is this? Well, I think it uh, avoids a bit of panic and, and chaos uh, for now. I think, you know, the, the SEC and 
uh, market participants, everyone seems on board that the tweak to this rule, which happened a little while back, was was aimed at penny stocks. You know, was aimed at equities, uh, but bonds were not exempt uh, from this rule change, uh, and that's why you're seeing a pause here uh, to give regulators and market participants a chance to. Uh, take some time and figure out where the exemption should be and how this, um, you know, how this plays out in the bond markets because nobody was ready for it to take effect now. So, Mike, what do we know about the SEC and actually what they want to regulate and, and what they're looking at, how aggressive actually they could be on this? So I think the, the intention here was to better regulate, you know, some of the pump and dump schemes that we've seen uh, in uh, thinly traded equities uh, in the penny stocks, as they're called. So um, that's what they're going after, and they're, they're trying to uh, put the onus on, on some of the, um, you know, on the broker dealers uh, to, you know, rein in the quotes that are, that are put up on that, on those securities. Uh, but because debt was not exempted from this, you know, you have ripple effects in the junk bond markets in mortgage-backed securities uh, where there's less transparency, but you have uh, more institutional players, more knowledgeable buyers. So, Mike, what does it mean, you know, concretely, when the U.S. opens today, what does it actually mean? Uh, it's business as normal for, for now. Um, I think the big question is, you know, January is not too far away. Uh, how do um, the, you know, SIFMA and the regulators uh, come to terms over the next few months into how this should actually be enforced on the bond markets? Um, do they go kind of asset class by asset class? Do they make a broad exemption? Uh, or is this something that broker dealers really have to get prepared for? Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Bloomberg's finance managing editor for EMEA, Michael Moore. Now, in the meantime, let's also do a quick market check as we look at the German results. We're also looking at live pictures from Die Linke. This is a far left party that didn't do as well as the polls were suggesting. So I don't know whether they regroup today, but certainly I don't think they have that 5% threshold, which means that they don't uh, get to make it to the Bundestag. European stocks, U.S. futures rising, investors assessing global growth and and whether it can withstand a slowdown in China and a global energy crunch. So coming up next, we'll talk a lot more about energy and what it means for fuel concerns. Also, China's Evergrande. The debt crisis keeps on festering. The data due this week may actually show manufacturing recovery in the world's second largest economy is faltering. Also, on this developing energy crisis, look, it's threatening to crimp global growth further at a real time where markets are also preparing for a tapering of Fed stimulus. So it's going to be a busy week. It's going to be an interesting and very nuanced week ahead as well. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Danny Berger joins me out of London. Kaylee Lines will be in New York. This is Bloomberg. The tail risk of a red-green-red government has been taken off the table. That is excellent news for the German economy. The question of a mandate, what the German voters really were telling us last night, is a big one. I think what the market is looking for is what you just indicated, a relatively um, long period of talks going on, taking potentially weeks or months. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, September 27th. Our top stories today. Germany in limbo. The Social Democrats turned back Angela Merkel's conservatives in an extremely close election. Now there could be months of negotiations to form a coalition. Showdown on Capitol Hill. A vote this week on President Biden's infrastructure bill is a crucial test for House Democrats. And the energy crisis goes global. It's not just Europe. This winter, millions of people will feel the impact of soaring natural gas prices.
Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London. Kelly Lines is in New York. Matt Miller off this week. Uh, Kelly, if we look at the markets, they're pretty much supported. I mean, questions over China, questions over the energy crisis, but actually that uh, tailwind that could have been, you know, happening in Germany off the table for now. Yeah, it's a very different story when you look at what's happening in Europe versus what is happening in China. But in many ways, it also is the same, Francine, in that China now is dealing with a potential power crunch of its own. All that said, in the Asian session overnight, we didn't see much dramatic movement. We were essentially flat on the Nikkei in Japan, flat on the Hang Seng as well, though we did see stocks rising about six tenths of one percent in China. Of course, you have the PBOC injecting another $15 billion worth of short term liquidity into the market. But at the same time, fears around that power crunch actually led to growth downgrade uh, forecast downgrades from Nomura and Morgan Stanley. So that fear around what the potential energy crunch could mean for factory production weighed most heavily on material stocks. The CSI materials index actually falling the better part of 4% in the overnight session. And of course, later on top of that, ongoing fears around China Evergrande and the crackdown on the property sector. And that has now spread to Sunak China, which is another property developer. Its bonds fell and its shares fell about 9.4% after it had to ask local government for help. In other asset classes, I would point to iron ore continuing its rebound futures up about 8% in the overnight session. We're back around $120. And you also had the Philippine peso underperforming in Asian FX actually at its weakest against the dollar since all the way back in March of 2020 after an official from the central bank said that he expects the currency to continue to depreciate. Now here in the U.S., we are coming off a weekly gain for equities, and it does look like those gains will continue on this Monday morning. Futures up about three tenths of 1% when it comes to S&P E-minis. You are starting to see yields moving even higher in the bond market, up two basis points on the 10-year Treasury yield. We're at 147 at the moment. And then I would just point to what's going on elsewhere in the commodity complex. WTI crude right around $75 a barrel. And the Bloomberg Commodity Index standing higher again today, up about three quarters of 1%. It is at its highest since going back to July of 2015. Yeah, those two things combined, commodities plus energy, is doing a lot of legwork when it comes to this European session. We're just seeing green basically in every single region. It is the energy stocks that are outperforming. But Fran, you mentioned this before. It is a rare treat when politics actually moves the market. It's quite different from the U.S. when a lot of that stagnation in terms of movement of politics doesn't do too much. DAX up about 1% today. Clearly the outperformer. There was a tail risk that we could get a far left coalition that has now been removed. Moved. You also have hopes for renewable stocks outperforming with the Greens doing very well in the election as well. So those type of stocks doing well. But as I was saying, it's all about energy today. It is all about the UK shortage of energy, the European in general crisis. So we're seeing right now energy stocks at their highest since March of this year, up more than 2%. So that's definitely giving a lift to the broader market. Now you're looking at a UK 10-year yield. The selling continues. I was really kicked off by the BOE last week. And they're more hawkish tilt, which of course, as we know, affected the U.S. markets as well. This is the highest gilt 10-year yield since 2019. Let that sink in. This is really a global market sovereign bond yields. I do, though, Francine, want to stick on the Germany story because I think this is fascinating. This is Vonovia. This is a German landlord. There have been some thoughts that the results were bad for landlords because in Berlin, they passed a referendum that would put some of the housing in the public's hands. But a referendum in Germany, it is not necessarily a mandate. Date. And because we didn't have that far left coalition, Maria Tadeo, or Maria Tadeo tells us that these results were positive for German landlords. So we're seeing Venovia shares up more than 4%, Francine. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny Berg. I mean, I think the, the main takeaway from the German election is probably it's going to be a more centrist government than maybe some of the fears to the right or to the left that we had in the last couple of months. Now, look at what else is going on this week. So today, the Fed governor, Lael Brainard, speaks at the National Association for Business Economic 63rd Annual Meeting tomorrow, a busy day for central banks. Well, Andrew Bailey will speak at the Society of Professional Economies dinner. Jay Powell will testify at the Senate Banking Committee hearing and Christine Lagarde at the ECB forum. Then on Thursday, the deadline for Congress to pass a stopgap funding bill to avert a government shutdown. And on Friday, Dubai hosts the Expo 2020 Global Trade Fair, one of the world's biggest in-person events since the pandemic actually began. So let's start in Germany. Olaf Scholz and his Social Democrats inch ahead of the CDU in a tight, tight election, though these preliminary results suggest there will be months of government building talks. Now for more on all of this, we're joined by Maria today in Berlin. Maria, both big uh, parties think they have a mandate. So who will the Liberals and the Greens choose? 
Yes, Francine, and that is very much the question. We know the SPD and the CDU are competing to trigger coalition talks. We've just heard, by the way, uh, from Olaf Scholz saying the message is very clear from German voters. We've added votes. The CDU has lost. We are the ones that should start the negotiation to get a coalition going, and the CDU should go into the opposition. Now, the kingmakers here, you could argue one is the Greens, of course, but I would highlight they came in third, and they say this is a great result for the Green Party. It is on record. But again, Francine, if you look back just a few months ago, the Greens were leading in polls, so they did lose a lot of momentum in the real vote. Now, they have signaled that they're ready to work with both, so really that puts the key to the next government on Christian Lindner of the Liberal Democrats. Now, yesterday he said something that really caught my eye, which is, before I get into serious negotiations with the CDU or the SPD, I want to talk with the Greens to see where are the common lines hmm. that we can draw from this. A natural ally from the Liberal Democrats would be the CDU, but again, Again, we're going to see a major, major beauty contest in order to attract him into a coalition. Both are one to uh, really going to uh, appease and attract Christian Lindner, who really does hold the key this morning in Berlin, and he is the center of attention here. Maria, I feel like for those unfamiliar with German politics, the length of this coalition wrangling often surprises some. What's sort of the estimate that we have in terms of time frames and timeline that this could take to actually form that coalition? Well, you know, uh, Danny, when you look at this from the outside, it does feel like Germany today is a mess. It looks like a mess. But again, one of the things, and, and Francine highlighted this too before, is that we're looking at two very centrist parties that are pro-European. There is no point of rupture with the uh, establishment. And this is going to be a very kind of pro-European government coming out of this. There is no red scare. There is no far to the left uh, coalition possible here. So again, we're looking at a very centrist government emerging from this election in terms of the timeline going forward it's really is anyone's guess you know we could have a government that is ready to go in two three months or you could go into the new year without a government in place in the meantime Angela Merkel will stay on the interim mm -hmm. again we could see Angela Merkel for a long time it's not a given that this is the last we're going to see from the German Chancellor anytime soon yet this thing is far from over thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Berlin now let's turn to Washington, D.C. and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi pledges to pass President Biden's $550 billion infrastructure bill this week. She also signaled that the headline amount on the administration's spending and tax package will be lowered from $3.5 trillion. She spoke on ABC yesterday. Let me just say we're going to pass the bill this week. Uh, the, the, uh, I promised that we would bring the bill to the floor. That was according to the language that those who wanted this to be brought to the floor tomorrow wrote into the rule. We will bring the bill to the floor tomorrow for, for um, consideration. But you know, I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins now from our D.C. Bureau. So Anne-Marie, it will be brought to the floor today. The vote will happen on Thursday. Mm -hmm. How much work has to happen between yes. now and that vote? Oof. A lot of work has to happen. You heard there from the speaker saying she's not going to bring a bill to the floor if it doesn't have the votes, which makes you think she had promised September 27th a vote on this bill. Uh, Representative Josh Gottheimer, who she made this deal with, and some House moderates seem to be okay with the fact that it's going to come to the floor to start the debate on it today, but it won't have a vote till Thursday. So she needs to find the votes by Thursday, which makes you think that she thinks she's going to get all those votes or she at least sees a path to getting those votes. Where what really needs to be done now is to get the two factions of her caucus and her party on board with the bigger reconciliation package until they can hammer out what exactly they agree that goes into this and the top line figure, then you're not going to be able to get the progressives on board in her party to vote for that bipartisan infrastructure agreement. Yeah, so Anne-Marie, I mean, this is a showdown, right, this week in Washington. Yes. And how much of it is actually Democrats, you know, fighting over the substance of this first bill or, you know, broader influence for the second bigger one? It, the first bill is pretty much taking care of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that has broad support, Francine. Uh, the problem is it's just being used as leverage right now for those House progressives. They are using it as leverage to say, we'll sign up for this, but we will only sign up for this when we get everything else that we've been and they've campaigned on. This is child care, Medicare, 
pre-K. There's a number of things. Climate change initiatives yeah. with Speaker Pelosi talking to ABC News so that there needs a lot of work to be done. This is their leverage, and progressives have said for weeks that they're not going to vote for bipartisan infrastructure, even though they do agree with it, but they mm. will only vote for it when they know they have the other package in hand. And all the while, we're also trying to avoid a government shutdown come the end of the week. Yes. Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordern in Washington, thank you so much. Now, China may be diving headfirst into a power supply shock. Rising demand for electricity and surging coal and gas prices are driving a crisis that is spreading globally. Bloomberg's energy reporter Stephen Sipsinski joins us now. So, Stephen, we've seen several downgrades to China GDP forecasts off of the back of the potential energy crisis. Just how bad could this get? You know, it, it, what, what the biggest issue is, is the rising energy prices, because you see coal prices are going higher, and Chinese coal power plants generate electricity, and they sell it um, basically at a, at a rate that the government decides. So right now, coal prices are too expensive to generate electricity, and that's causing some power plants across the country to shut down. That's already creating an outage um, for some households, even. Uh, so it, it, it could get bad if... if if these power plants aren't able mm -hmm. to sell electricity at higher rates or if coal prices don't fall down. And if it gets cold, uh, well, then everything goes out the window and demand for, for all energy and all fuel will rise. And that creates an even further crunch for, for China. Stephen, I feel like we only just wrapped our head around the crisis, energy crisis in Europe. If this causes prices to move higher because of what's happening in China, could we see an exacerbation of prices in Europe as well? Absolutely. I mean, what we're already seeing today, and I just saw it late last week, is there's this bidding war between China and Europe for liquefied natural gas. Because China needs the gas, and so does Europe, and China's just willing to pay more. So the more that Europe bids up, the more you see the European and Dutch TTF prices go up, China's willing to pay a little bit more than that every time that goes up. And so you're seeing this back and forth. Thrown into the mix as well is Brazil. Brazil's having the worst uh, uh, shortage of, uh, of, of water. There's a drought there in a long time that's cutting hydropower and boosting their gas fire power generation. So these three regions, South America, Asia, and Europe, are fighting over a finite amount of gas. And that's just only yeah. going to have a feedback loop for LNG and gas prices going forward. Bloomberg's energy reporter, Stephen Sipsitsky, thank you so much. And, of course, that is our big take story today. You can find more on the energy crisis on your terminal or online. Now let's take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. A big one to the upside is Gore's Guggenheim, the special purpose acquisition company. This is on reports that it's going to buy the – or merge, excuse me – require the Swedish EV maker Polestar in a deal worth about $20 billion. So that stock is up 8% in pre-market trading. Another stock moving to the upside is Carnival Cruise Lines. Of course, it reported results on Friday. Went pretty well. It actually saw the shares rising for a third day on Friday. And it does look like those gains will continue today. The stock up the better part of 3% in early hours. And finally, we were talking about the gains we are seeing across oil today. And that is reading through to energy stocks in pre-market trading. One of them being Apache or APA Corp. It's higher by about 37 percent before the bell frenzy. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Oil extending a surge as WTI uh, jumping above $75 on this global energy crunch. Now, coming up in the next hour, we'll talk more about the energy crunch. We'll also talk about Germany with Martin Look, BlackRock's chief investment strategist for Germany. We'll talk about coalition building. We'll talk about the impact also it has on renewables in Germany and the rest of Europe. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger alongside Francine Lacqua in London and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Guys, I have a chart that I really love. And it was flagged to me by Eddie Vanderwall. And I love it because every day I learn something new about what's on the terminal. And it really surprises me. So what I have for us today is data that we have that's UK power generation via wind. Again, I was very surprised that this was on here. And I didn't know why I didn't know about this before. Because if you're trying to track the energy crisis in Europe, here is a very good place to look. I also want to welcome our radio viewers as well and explain to you what exactly I have on this chart because, of course, you can't see it. So it looks pretty volatile, to be clear. The high higher it goes, the more windy it is in the UK and the more wind output in terms of energy we're getting. Now, if you look over the past few months, 
it's been pretty low. The kind of average here has been far under what we would have seen in past years. And this contributed to that energy crunch we saw in the UK that has led to things uh, like shortage of natural gas and oil as well. But look, it has spiked in recent days. So the question is, are things getting better? Let's ask that question to Eddie Vanderwall of Bloomberg Live, who, Eddie, thanks again for flagging this data point to me. So let me bring that to you. Is this a silver lining? Are things going to get better for the UK energy situation? You know, I, I can confirm it is very windy outside. I had to walk my kids to uh, to school this morning. And, and look, um, yes, as you say, the upside here is that if the wind blows faster, we get more power from our windmills, which means we don't rely so much on natural gas in Europe. But but really, you know, the, the, the energy shortage in Europe isn't going to go away. And, and a couple of days of wind is not going to solve this. Really, what we need is three things. We need faster wind speeds. We need mild temperatures so that people don't turn on their they're heating at home and we need Nord Stream 2. And that brings us back to Germany because this is becoming a political issue there. It is certainly becoming a political issue and maybe one of the most significant things that Angela Merkel leaves behind. Um, but Eddie, here the concern in the UK is not really that we don't have the fuel, is that the fuel, because of the lack of drivers, can't get to the fuel pump. Right. So, so, so the fuel, the fuel issue in the UK is slightly different because, of course, as you say, I mean, this is part of our supply chain disruption. All, all of these things, of course, interlinked. Um, but I, I, you know, I think uh, drivers are struggling. And over the weekend, we saw queues. I mean, I, I had to fill up because my wife had to go to work this morning, and we we saw we we saw queues of a half an hour. It was the shortest that you could find at any any petrol station. But this is a, a wider issue in the UK, right? Because we're struggling not only with um, not only with gasoline, we're struggling keeping these the, the shelves in the in the in the shops um, stocked up, uh, and I think some emergency uh, yeah. methods will have to be, or the, the government will have to take some some emergency steps to to address this. Eddie, it's not just Europe that is dealing with a, a power crunch. China is dealing one with dealing with one now as well. How crucial is the China data going to be this week? China is absolutely important. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, as you say, the energy markets are just so interlinked at the moment, right? Particularly as a result of liquid, liquefied natural gas, because there's this bidding war going on. We just heard from your last speaker. But I, I do think that it all comes back to, to Germany for me over the, over the next few weeks. Because as Maria T Tadeo said earlier, right, we've got the, the, the FDP of FPD and, and the Greens who are holding the balance of power. Both of those parties are anti-Nord Stream. And if we don't see Nord Stream come online quickly, we are going to struggle to see, uh, you know, n natural gas flowing into Europe, and that's going to have knock-on implications and could put a drag on the China growth as well. And if you look at some of the calls from the banks, so at the moment, WTI jumping above $75. If you look at Brent, it's at $79. And then Goldman saying that Brent could go to $90. I mean, what happens if WTI hits 80 What happens? Yeah, I mean, look, in higher energy prices are a drag on the world economy. Every time you fill up your pump, every time you switch on a light, every time you switch on a machine, you pay more money for it if, if energy costs keep rising. The, 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 the situation in oil for me is a little bit perplexing because I'm expecting to see OPEC pump into these rallies. The higher oil prices go, the more oil OPEC would li like to bring back to the market because, remember, they have put significant caps on their members, and I think they would like to start pumping again. But I think the energy crisis isn't going to go away, even if we see Brent prices coming back. But those are very optimistic calls. And if we do see oil at $90 a barrel, then, you know, that, that really will put another drag on the world economy. Eddie, thanks so much. Eddie van der Valt there from our Bloomberg Markets live team joining us today. Now, of course, for more market analysis, just check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Coming up, we'll have more on your markets. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua and Danny Berger in London. Now let's get the first word news. And the Securities and Exchange Commission is delaying enforcement of what some bond traders called an unreasonable rule. The measure is intended to protect investors from pump and dump schemes often skiing in penny stocks. Previously, the rule hadn't been applied to fixed income, and industry groups say more time is needed to create a framework for the change. The SEC won't enforce the rule for at least three months. And China will take further steps to rein in Internet companies. A top government cyberspace official told the World Internet Conference that curbing monopolistic behavior and the disorderly expansion of capital are top priorities. He cited the shared economy, online health care, and smart delivery of, as areas of concern. Coming up, we'll talk about China risk and Germany's election results with Martin Luck, BlackRock chief investment strategist for Germany. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. Danny, of course, a lot of the focus is on what's happening with Evergrande. And then here, the German election, no surprises because it seems to be much more centrist, which is giving a nice lift to the markets. Exactly. I think this is pretty significant after a week where China really dominated the moves in Europe. You couldn't go a day without talking about Evergrande and what that was doing. But here we have finally a local story, German politics being the one to be able to dictate moves in this market. Now, we're just looking at live pictures from the SPD. Germany's SPD holding a post-election briefing with the party leader, Olaf Scholz. So more on this with, uh, of course, in a moment with our Chad Thomas in Berlin. So, okay, I'm all over the coalitions, um, Danny, here. And if you look at mathematically what could mm. happen, so there are basically two to three possible coalitions once it's a grand coalition. So let's put that out of the way. Right. And then it basically depends on whether, you know, the Greens and the Liberals, the FDP, would rather be with the Conservatives, the SDU or mm. the SPD. I feel right. like there's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> there are certainly a lot to keep track of. But I think it is those two are the key. I mean, Maria today has been talking about this all day. They're kind of the so-called kingmakers. And in terms of navigating these markets, it's their policies that it's I think a lot of people are looking to to try to yeah. figure out what do I want to own, what do I avoid, what does this mean for Germany and the economy to come? Yeah, and of course, if the Liberals want their guy in charge of the finance ministry, it means possibly a little bit less integration for Europe, but, but actually nothing too unbusiness friendly. Kaylee, how's it all shaping up in the markets? Well, Francine, we are seeing a nice lift to German equities today. The DAX is one of the outperformers in the European session, up the better part of 1%. You also are seeing pretty broad-based gains for the stock 600 as well. Now, here in the U.S., we are coming off a weekly gain for the equity market, and it does look like those will continue today. Futures are off session highs, but we're still up about a quarter of a percent on S&P E-minis. Interesting in the bond market, the older the session grows, the higher yields have become. We're up about three basis points now on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. We're sitting at one. 48.45. We're a lot closer to 150 than we are to 140 at this point. And then I would just point to oil continuing its gains up 1.3% on WTI, trading just under $75 a barrel. You have a tightening market because of that global energy crunch. Now, of course, a lift in oil usually corresponds with a lift in energy-related equities, and that definitely is the case looking at pre-market trading. The energy select sector spider ETF up about 1.8 percent. That'll kind of tell you how the energy sector as a whole will do come the opening bell. And a number of names moving to the upside, Occidental Petroleum, Continental Resources, Marathon Oil, all up in the tune of 2 to 2.7 percent, Francine. Now, with no clear majority, Kaylee, in the German election, the decision is yet to be made of who will lead Europe's biggest economy. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Chad Thomas in Berlin. Chad, so let's simplify things, all right? You can either see a coalition with the people from Merkel's government and her party or the SPD, Olaf Scholz, and it's basically the two kingmakers, the Greens and the Liberals, that will have to choose who they form a government with. Well, that's absolutely right, Francine. And we had Olaf Scholz, he's speaking right now to reporters, and he clearly wants to seize the momentum. He told reporters uh, just minutes ago that he will move forward with trying to form a coalition with the FTP and the Greens. He wants to do that within weeks, he says. And it was also interesting to hear someone from his, one of the leaders in his party saying that they will not hold talks with Merkel's party to try and form a coalition. So clearly, they want to plow ahead with this potential option. Of course, ultimately, it really is up to the FDP and the Greens who they want to be in a coalition with. And they have said they're going to hold talks with one another before they hold talks with the SPD 
or with Merkel's party. So we'll be watching that, of course, today. And uh, mm -hmm. Armin Laschet, the head of, the, of Merkel's party, he is meeting with the party leadership of his party right now. We'll be hearing from him a little bit later today to see what their strategy is going forward. Right. I was going to say yesterday it was a pretty defiant lash at essentially saying that they too would try to form a coalition. Given the very disappointing results, what does the future and maybe near term future the next few months hold for the conservatives? Well, this is really the big question here, and we're sort of hearing and German media is reporting out of this meeting as it's happening that he's sort of pulling, he's toning that down a little bit, this idea that they have a mandate, but that he will still continue to try and hold talks to form a government. But it will be interesting to see also how uh, the Bavar there's a Bavarian sister party to Merkel's party. They're really important in all of this. The leader of that party is actually an internal rival to Armin Laschet. So his continued backing, this guy's name is Marcus Zoda. He's the prime minister of Bavaria. His continued backing will be very important for Armin Laschet, whether he's going to be able to hang on. Chad, thank you so much for the terrific briefing. Chad Thomas uh, there, our bureau chief. Now let's get straight to Martin Luke, BlackRock Investment Institute, chief investment strategist for Germany. Martin, if you look at the various coalitions and actually what exactly we could see, what does it mean for German equity? So they've underperformed the rest of Europe. Is now a time where they could come roaring back? Yeah, good morning, Francine, and thank you for having me. So I think, uh, you know, there is a good chance uh, now that the next German government will be more centrist, either uh, center-left or center-right, uh, with, as you just heard uh, from, from Chad, the center-right version being slightly less, uh, less likely. So in any, in any event, there, there is a strong perception within the German electorate that uh, a, a big push for investment is needed. That is a green investment, that is digitalization investment, that is also uh, investment in infrastructure, mainly in public transport. Uh, so uh, what this means for, for German equities and, of course, for, for, for the companies that stands behind it is... Uh, a, a big, a big push uh, to to more investment. This is definitely good news. And uh, and, and in any event, the, ne the next administration will have a long list of tasks to ad address, uh, and uh, the yeah. German corporate sector will be heavily involved. So this is why I think that so, uh, equity investors are looking positively at this. So, Martin, is there actually something amongst equities that will do best? If you look at some of the sectors, maybe there's going to be a boost from real estate. The other one, of course, is renewables, because German wind and solar capacity needs to increase by 62 percent by 2030 if they're going to meet those goals. Absolutely. And, and this, is, this is just one of the sectors. This is the, maybe the most obvious one. Uh, you know, uh, renewable energy uh, companies will be, will be in focus. But another sector that, is, that will be in focus is uh, technology investment. Uh, and that mainly is uh, 5G connectivity, that is uh, digitalization infrastructure and more in general. And, and also maybe as a, as a learning effect from the COVID crisis, a more investment in healthcare and the connection between all this, you know, healthcare technology, digitization technology, and of course, green technology. This is where, where all these, these areas come together. So I think that innovative companies with a, with a strong business model in these sectors will be the beneficiaries. And there are probably others, but this very much depends on the agenda of this new administration. Martin, how will this position Germany versus the rest of Europe in terms of your investment thesis? Well, I think that, you know, there has been some hesitation uh, on the part of many investors for, uh, for the recent months, if not uh, quarters, uh, regarding uh, Germany's ability to reform. You know, the, the, the last really push for reform that was brought forward by the Schroeder administration uh, in the early 2000s, the Agenda 2010, that is almost 18 years ago. So there is, it's now high time for this country to reform, and there is a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with large parts of the electorate that this has not happened. So I think that, you know, with this, if, if there were to be a good uh, opportunity or good likelihood in the upcoming election, uh, in the upcoming uh, coalition talks, that this is about to happen. This was, will also create a lot of confidence among investors, uh, German equity investors, and of course, foreign mm -hmm. equity investors in Germany, that this is about to happen. This could strengthen uh, German equities versus the rest of Europe, because this uh, there has been lots of hope in other countries uh, when Mar Mario Draghi became prime minister in Italy a while ago, etc., when Macron became prime minister in France a while ago. And now there is yeah. a real push for a reformist government in Germany as well. 
obviously there's the political considerations when thinking about if you want to invest in Europe. There is also the monetary policy considerations. And as we see central banks largely moving toward a more hawkish stance, the ECB is a little bit behind. How do you think about that when thinking about Europe? I think that's right. And I think there is more divergence to come between Europe and the U.S. when it comes to monetary policy. Uh, it's only last week that the Fed gave a very clear indication that they are moving a bit faster than uh, had been anticipated by the markets uh, um, until now, uh, whereas the ECB is now really trying to step uh, and, and to, to, to kind of tap its toes into uh, um, tapering the PEP in the first place, but they're making sure that they will keep liquidity supply ample at the same time, and there has been no talk whatsoever in uh, Europe regarding lift off yet. So the gap between the pace of monetary policy uh, between the US and, and Europe is probably set to widen. And then it also depends mm. on this new German government uh, as to whether they will form a new shape of, uh, of kind of cooperation with the central bank because so much pressure with regard to European integration has been right. uh, on the ECB so far mm. and probably too much. In terms of growth in Germany, so you've, I, I understand your thesis that it's a lot about investment, that we'll get more of it considering how the election looks to be shaping up. But Martin, to play devil's advocate, I wonder how much room Germany has to maneuver given the constitutional debt breaks in place. That's a very good question. I think that that will be one of the crucial issues here. Of course, there is a, there is a strong German push to go back to what, what is usually per, per, uh, perceived in this country as financial stability. And there is, this is much to do with the debt break. So really do not incur further debt. However, at the same time, everybody understands, or most people in this country understand, that there, there, there needs to be a big investment push, especially in the fields that I mentioned, digitization, and, and, et cetera, green technology. Um, so it, th there might be a solution in the future where formally the new government holds, holds on to the debt break. At the same time, there is a kind of an, an exemption clause for investment in the fields of uh, green technology and digitalization and other stuff that this country urgently needs. So there might be, you know, bringing these two things together is, the, is, is one of the crucial um, legal tasks in the first place, because the debt break is a constitutional mm -hmm. issue. And secondly, also in terms of communicating that to the public, which is very hesitant when it comes to future debt. So I think uh, this is one of the biggest tasks maybe for this, for this new government. But my sense is that the combination of Olaf Scholz and the leading personnel on the part of the Greens and the FDP would be exactly right to do that. Thank you so much. Martin Luke there of BlackRock joining us this morning. Now, there's an ongoing briefing at the SPD headquarters with Olaf Scholz. He's fielded two questions in English. He's actually responded in English. This is one of the first time uh, that I think a, a potential leader has done so. Now, what we know is that, you know, uh, Olaf Scholz said the SPD's policy program contributed to the election results. So he claims he's mandated now to push through as many of his party policies on the possible coalition negotiations. So we'll see whether he gets something through. It could last months. It could last a little bit less. But certainly, that's the thinking of the markets right now. Coming up, China's crypto crackdown. We'll discuss the risks of regulation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, Port of Los Angeles Executive Director Gene Sororka. This is Bloomberg. China has banned crypto close to eight or nine times now, I believe. But now it's directly prohibiting its citizens, which is certainly going to have a dampening effect on their ability to use cryptocurrencies uh, for any sort of transactions. As a soft power move, this may perhaps be a misstep from China. Each time we've seen this challenge come up or a more prohibitive stance come up, we've seen truly the resiliency of the community around digital assets. And that exchange volume has moved to other geographies. Some of our top guests weighing in on China's multi-year crackdown on the crypto industry, which of course was accelerated on Friday with the PBOC saying that all transactions are illegal. Joining us now is Joanna Ossinger, who leads our coverage of cryptocurrencies in Asia. So, Joanna, 
we obviously had China taking a very hard line on Friday that took Bitcoin down on Friday. And yet this morning, we're right around $44,000, essentially back to where we were before the headline crossed. Why? Right, Kaylee, it's pretty interesting. And some of this is, as the, as the guests were saying before, that people have seen some of this before. And of course, this is a bigger move than we've seen in the past. And you do have numerous agencies that are involved with it. You have about 10 agencies that could be involved, which shows that they might be doing something more widely. But a lot of people in China had already made plans around this. And to some extent, it wasn't all that unexpected. So crypto is right back to where it was before. Yeah, Joanna, I mean, one of the things, and actually, um, you know, that, that's been doing the rounds on social media, if you're a crypto bear, what would it take you to stop being a crypto bear? And this is really, is this the only question that we need to ask ourselves? <laughs> It, that is a good question. I mean, it, there are times where it looks like things are going down, but you have had just this enormous rally over the past year or so. And if you've been in it for even five or six years, you've done really, really well. At the same time, you know, it, there are cracks around the edges. There is a lot of question with regard to global regulation, not just out of China. But for certain people in China are, are looking at how to deal with this, looking at workarounds and kind of figuring out what they can do now that this is happening. But again, if, you know, people are expecting even a full ban. You know, it, there, this is not too much of a surprise. And people keep saying, oh, after China makes a move like this, crypto goes higher. That's the, the narrative from the bulls. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem like it takes a lot, Joanna. So if China is cracking down on crypto more and there's a vacuum, what fills that vacuum? Well, it, it could be the digital yuan, Danny. I mean, it, that's one thing, that's one theory that they're making way for their own digital currency. And of course, there are concerns about retail consumers being scammed. There are scams in crypto, so, you know, and as well as people taking assets abroad. So there are numerous reasons that the PBOC might be doing this, but the digital yuan does loom large in this discussion. Joanna, thank you so much for the terrific briefing. Joanna Ossinger there on crypto. Now, later today, we'll also be speaking with the chief executive and co-founder of eToro, Yoni Asia. That's at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London, Kelly Lines in New York. We're also joined by Tom King Quanker of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, I know you have a great chart for us, and I know you're looking at inflation points. Well, we're looking at the markets. The markets are really, really interesting this morning. The correlations and some of the breakouts or near breakouts that we're at. Speaking of a breakout, and this does fold into the German elections and all that we're going to see in the coming 48 uh, hours with our great coverage. And this is nothing more than the German 10 year yield adjusted for inflation, and down we go. This is a banded range going back a good 10 years, and down we go, a solid four standard deviations. And I'm sorry, this is the great, great financial challenge to the coalition. Speaking of standard deviations and massive moves, Tom, we're looking at near 150 on the 10-year yeah. Treasury yield. I mean, we're 16 basis points above where we were on Wednesday after the Fed decision. I know you saw the opening script for what we're going to do in the next hour, and it's right there with the yen moving out to 111. What we see in oil with a Brent crude near $80 print, yes, the 10-year yield's front and center with a 150. And the pros, Kaylee, what they will say is it's rate of change. It's the movement mm. out there. Francine Kaylee is expert on the calculus. <laughs> of all this expert i know two standard deviation tom it's all thanks to you tom our great master of, of great elegant such charts. a nerd alert tom is my I, calculus I, coach yeah run as far as fast as you can <laughs> you know, just... markets are yeah, interesting he's my cfa coach it's not going great tom oil Oil's the big one, actually, that I know you're it really you're is. having a, You know, <clears throat> what happens if WTI is 80? Yeah. Well, I think John Farrell's accurate in that Francisco Blanche of Bank of America stopped the world about eight days ago, maybe 10 days ago, modeling out above $80 a barrel. We've heard a lot of people model out the microeconomics to $80 a barrel. Blanche goes further. He goes out to $100 a barrel. And again, Francine, it's the rate of change up. I'm looking right now at Brent crude, $79. 12 cents a barrel, and we're getting there. 
I mean, speaking of rate of change, what's happened on the UK guilt yield is pretty significant, too. Uh, I mean, yes, it's a bond on the periphery, but at its highest since 2019. I mean, Tom, what do you make of this movement being dictated by some of those bonds that we wouldn't really think would be the catalyst to push around the Treasury? Well, they're, they're correlated again. And I, I would say the central banker of the world is the key one, and that is Jerome Powell. A lot of speaking, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. going on this week. But, you know, I look at gilts and I look at Indonesia and I say it's all linked into U.S. tenure. And again, the real yield, I look very carefully at the real yield chart today. And it really technically hasn't broken out, even though we have a lesser negative number on that. It needs to go further before I go, oh, wow. Mm. Tom, thank you so much. Yes, sure. Tom says, oh, wow, you better watch out. Tom and Conker. Talking about talking. Oh, Bloomberg's about. Yeah, not, I know, not yet. Without. I know. We don't mention the Spurs, Tom, on this the show. Spurs, uh, let's also know. look at what else you we're shouldn't. watching uh, today. Kaylee, away from football. Yeah. English football, we talk about the Fed. As exciting as that is, there is a lot of Fed speak to pay attention to. I would also point out, as we were just talking about yields with Tom Keene, the belly of the curve, the five-year rising to 99 basis points, which is the highest since February of 2020. Of course, the belly of the curve pricing in a different Fed policy than it was just a week ago. And it'll be interesting to see how much color we get on that when we hear from Charles Evans of the Chicago Fed, uh, Leo Brainerd, uh, the Fed governor, and uh, New York pres Fed president John Williams throughout the day today. They are, of course, are voting members, they lean in the more dovish direction. So it'll be interesting to see what they say about when liftoff could come, given we all are pretty sure that tapering is going to come in November, Danny. Kaylee, I'm watching something a little closer to Francine and me here. Of course, it could have implications, or it rather does have implications for the entirety of the world, and that's the how the energy crisis is involving. It's become a very large political issue in the U.K. They're looking at bringing the army in to drive tanks because there's a lack of drivers for that petrol. Uh, politicians have had different posturing, saying, don't rush to the gasoline pumps. That's what's driving this. So I'm really interested to see how that evolves, specifically what politicians will say, Francine. Yeah, I can't find a taxi anymore. I know you're probably the same. Yeah. I mean, it does have like a repercussion on your daily life <laughs> in London. The other thing we're watching is coalition building. Now, it's interesting to uh, hear from Olaf Schultz, who is just speaking to reporters at SPD headquarters. He was saying, look, he wants some kind of coalition and government in place by December. He was really funny. First of all, he took two questions in English and um, a British journalist asked the most pressing question of the day, which is, well, Olaf Schultz sent German truck drivers to the UK to help them out of the crisis. So he was very funny. He says, look, the room erupted in laughs and uh, he did not commit to send uh, drivers over. But he was quite also elusive in saying, look, the conversations that he's having with his possible coalition partners, he does not want to do in front of the media, but he called them friends and we know that they've reached out. So it'll be interesting to see where we end up in the next couple of days. More Bloomberg surveillance up ahead. We'll hear from Jim Karen of Morgan Stanley, amongst others. So we'll, of course, have a full roundup of the energy crisis, the debt ceiling and treasuries. This is Bloomberg.